In business today, three things to know. First, plunged into the deep freeze again. A monster ice storm in the south and snowstorm in the northeast. Then, pay raise. President Obama acts unilaterally to raise the minimum wage of federal contract workers. Is there an impact on small business? And using DNA to heal injuries, how scientific breakthroughs are changing the way doctors treat ailments. A Rise Exchange starts now. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Schmertz. We're gonna have more on the monster ice storm that is whipping through the south and headed north in a moment. But first, the U.S. Senate has approved raising the debt ceiling a day after the Republican House did the same. It is a clean bill, meaning no strings attached, and will now go to President Obama for his signature. The move means no government shutdown. On Wall Street, they saw that as good news, but a small pullback following yesterday's rally. Let's take a look at the final numbers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at 15,962, down about 32 points. The S&P 500 slumping at about a half a point to 1819. And the Nasdaq did move up 10 points to 4201. Taking a look at our top stocks we're watching today, the world's largest household products maker, Procter & Gamble cut its sales and earnings outlook for the year because of the devaluation of currencies in emerging markets. This caused the company's shares to tumble by almost 2% in early trading and weighed down the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Procter & Gamble finishing down nearly 2% to 7749 Sales of Ford in China rose by 53% last month and posted a record of 94,466 vehicles sold compared to about 61,000 in January of 2013. Ford closed up $0.04 cents to 15 and CVS Caremark reported revenues of $32.8 billion, beating analyst estimates of $32.7 billion. The drugstore chain announced last week it's stepping and stopping the sale of cigarettes and other tobacco-related products in its stores by October 1st. CVS closing down to $68.54. Commodities, gold up to $12.90, and oil back over that $100 a barrel mark to $124. The Senate voted on the debt ceiling Wednesday in an effort to beat the storm and get out of town, a storm that meteorologists are calling a potential catastrophe for the South. In Atlanta, people woke up to a city encased in ice, snow, and freezing rain. Roads are iced over, tens of thousands are now without power, and airlines have canceled thousands more of flights. That storm is now moving up the East Coast and is expected to drop up to 16 inches of snow in some Northeast regions. AccuWeather senior meteorologist Bernie Reno joins us now from State College, Pennsylvania. Bernie, I understand the snow is probably headed your way. What is the latest on the storm? Well, it's causing major problems down in the southeast. Snow and sleet in Atlanta, right along Interstate 20 for Columbia. Many problems uh, this afternoon in the city of Charlotte and Raleigh, where people uh, left work to get home as the snow started to fall, and many have been stranded on the roadways, and many have abandoned their cars. The snow is moving to the north, snowing in Roanoke, snowing in Richmond, and that snow is heading toward New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, and Boston, over the next 12 hours. We're seeing a little bit of what Atlanta went through just a couple of weeks ago with people abandoning their cars. Winter only half over so far. and We've had record cold and snow days. Anything particular driving this weather pattern? No, you know what? It's winter, and this is <laughs> what happens. And I think the problem is, Andrew, a lot of people have forgotten what the real winter is like in the Northeast. We haven't had that for the most part, although New England got hit pretty hard late last year. But it's been a relatively uneventful winter, and this, although it's, it's snowier and colder than it normally is, but uh, certainly uh, this winter has been a lot more uh, hazardous as far as snow, ice, and cold than what we've seen in the last few years. We've talked about this a little bit, the economic impact. How are weather-sensitive companies now adjusting? Are we seeing a better performance from the airlines, for example? Well, I, I think the problem is, is when you get the snow that is going to, and the snow and ice that is going to um, cover such a large area and the major airline hubs, you go right down the East Coast, Atlanta, Charlotte, Philly, Ronald Reagan National Airport, Dulles, Newark, LaGuardia, JFK, up in the Boston. Once you get the lays there, and we're going to have them, we're already getting them into the south, you're going to have ripple effects across the entire country. Already 3,000 flights have been canceled today 
2000 tomorrow. So this is certainly going to have a huge, huge impact, impact in the airline industry. Bernie, I, I remember a few years ago, meteorologists you know, had kept almost crying wolf on storms that were coming, saying we're going to get this terrible snowstorm, terrible storms that wouldn't materialize. Now you guys are getting a lot of this right, and I'm wondering if people are responding correctly to the warnings out there. Well, I, you know, I think the problem is, is that you know, generally the people in the Northeast understand snowstorms and understand how to drive in them and how to react in them. The problem we've had this year is snow in areas that don't typically get a lot of snow. And it's interesting talking to people that I know down in Charlotte and Raleigh. They made this, the people down there made the same mistake as they did in Atlanta. They went to work. Right. It started the snow. Everybody got out in the roads right when the snow started. And then you have problems. Yeah, we do okay in New York. And, of course, as you head up the northeast into New England, they do pretty well. This is really a no-brainer for them. Let me ask you about natural gas and propane prices. Those have started to go up because of demand. Do we have enough to satisfy the demand in this winter? Well, I, I mean, certainly I think the answer is yes on that. But, but certainly because of the cold and how cold it's going to be, it's going to be at least for the rest of this week, they're certainly going to put pressure on that. Now, here's the good news. There is going to be a little break from this cold as we get toward the middle and the latter half of next week. But, you know, we still have a long time to go in this winter, and I think that's going to continue to be a problem unless the pattern goes to a much warmer one. And I'm not sure that that is the case. You know, it's funny, Bernie, that the Super Bowl, the day of the Super Bowl in New York, it was in the 50s, and now mm -hmm. we're getting wild. We almost, it's almost like we're paying for it from Mother Nature. Thank you so much, Bernie. We'll Always talk to you my later. my pleasure, Andrew. President Obama has upped the minimum wage for federal contract workers to $10.10 .10 an hour, up from $7.25. He did this by executive order without the approval of Congress. Also this week, the president delayed another provision of his Affordable Care Act by executive order, again, giving small businesses with fewer than 100 employees an extra year to comply with the health care law. Aaron Smith from A.W. Smith Financial is a frequent commentator with us on small business issues, and he is joining us in Richmond, Virginia, where so far I hope the weather is holding. Aaron, welcome back to our Rising exchange. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to be here, Andrew. Thank you for having me once again. So let me start with the minimum wage issue. Uh, does, does the raising of federal contract workers, and this is important, it's not just federal workers, it's companies that have contracts with the federal government, is that going to impact small businesses? Well, Andrew, first of all, small business, the Small Business Administration has defined small business as a business, an opportunity for individuals who own a business, operate a business, to have at least 1,500 employees yeah. uh, within their businesses. As it relates to the, the, the rate of pay, we are concerned about that. We're certainly concerned about that. You have the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, Andrew, who is really concerned about uh, if this is going to affect hiring or not. Then on the other side, you got the Economic Chamber uh, or Economic Council of Advisors, Andrew, who say it's not going to be effect, uh, an effect at all. But what I am telling you and what we're seeing as small business owners is that we're concerned about our employees. We want to make sure that our employees have the best, but we want to make sure that we're also able to afford, Andrew, to pay those employees. Sure. Yeah, l let me ask you that. Where do you come down on the side of, because this is for federal workers, but obviously he is pushing states to raise their minimum wage as well, and maybe Congress to raise the federal minimum wage. Where are the most small businesses coming down? Um, do you believe that this ultimately hurts job creation? Well, the small business owners are really, Andrew, more concerned about uh, profitability in their business and taking care of their employees. That's what they really care about. They do not want the administration to unilaterally make a decision on raising the minimum wage to any number. We want to make sure that it's, it's, it's beneficial not only for the employees that work for us, but we want to make sure that it's, that it's beneficial also for uh, corporations. We are the drivers of this economy. Let's face it, at the end of the day, it's important for us to be able to be comfortable and what we do in our businesses, and we don't want the administration dictating to us what we should be doing. Look, we need to create an environment to create better paying jobs, and the government has a role in that from a regulatory standpoint. Let me ask you about the president's decision. You and I have talked about the Affordable Care Act over and over again. Uh, the president's decision now to delay it uh, for another year has got to be welcome news to small businesses, but yet another confusing touch tone for them. Well, I tell you, the optimism index has increased over the last three, uh, three consecutive months, Andrew. I think I lost you a little bit here. 
um, but over the last three uh, consecutive months. And part of that has to do with the Affordable Health Care Act and how the uh, administration has delayed has delayed this mandate. And we're so excited about the fact that the president is at least listening right now to small business owners. That's certainly important to us as we go forward here. And finally, Aaron, I want to talk to you about the issue of business tax deductions. Congress dropping the ball here, frankly, not extending what had been traditional tax breaks for businesses. That, I think, is going to have a significant impact because they cannot buy the products that they used to buy. You know, absolutely. I mean, we're taking two steps forward and one step back. It's almost like a, a romance dance that we're taking with these, small, with these small business owners in the administration and Congress. It is uh, alarming that Congress has not passed what we are accustomed to is having these write-offs. These write-offs are important not only to small businesses for themselves, but more important for their employees, for the opportunities that they have with uh, I say, Andrew, the opportunity that is important uh, with uh, research and things that business owners need to do to continue to That's grow right. this economy. Research and development, for example, and of course depreciation. When you buy certain types of equipment, you get to depreciate it. That's a tax break. That helps people throughout the entire product chain. Aaron Smith, thank you so much. Stay safe in the storm. Oh, man, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. And coming up, a home improvement company is building on its workforce by tens of thousands. Find out who when a rise exchange comes back. Arise News is a different kind of network. We are able to tell our own stories, and we're able to cover stories in a way that other media outlets don't do. We've got world-class journalists, veteran journalists who have been in this industry for decades, not just in front of the camera, but behind the scenes as well. Arise News is a place where we can tell stories in an interesting, factual, inclusive way like no one else in the business can. Welcome back to Exchange. Time now for our business ticker. Home Depot has begun filing and filling more than 80,000 positions nationwide. The new hires are in preparation for the spring, the company's busiest selling season. Home Depot is the world's largest home improvement retailer with more than 2,200 retail stores in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Canada, and Mexico. Americans aren't feeling that their cars are so reliable as they used to be. That's according to a new study by J.D. Power released today, which found that vehicle dependability has declined for the first time since 1998. The brands that fared worse in this year include Ford, Hyundai, and Nissan. However, not all automakers suffered a decline, topping the list for the third consecutive year as the most dependable, Lexus, followed by Mercedes-Benz and Cadillac. And speaking of autos, two retail recalls announced today. The first covers 1.9 million Toyota Prius cars sold worldwide due to a programming glitch in the hybrid system that could cause cars to stop suddenly. The recall affects Prius vehicles with the model year between 2010 and 2014. So far, no accidents have been reported related to the defect. And baby products maker Graco recalling 3.7 million children car seats, one of the largest such recalls ever. This despite the company continuing to contest the results of a federal investigation that found defects in the seat's buckles, which pose a safety risk in post-crash emergencies that require children to be quickly freed from their harnesses. Graco's recall affects more than 12 models of car seats produced between 2009 and 13, including three booster seat models. The company is offering improved replacement buckles for customers at no cost. Apparently, CEOs aren't immune to having their credit cards hacked. PayPal chief executive David Marcus had his credit card details stolen and used for a shopping spree, even though his card has the more, more secure EMV chip technology currently used in Europe. Marcus believes the card was probably skimmed during a recent visit to the UK. And not to miss a chance to promote his own company's security benefits, Marcus said the breach would not have happened if the merchant had accepted PayPal as a form of payment. Well, the shopping mall is practically a teenage rite of passage for American suburban kids, a place to hang out on the weekends. But the shopping mall may become a thing of the past. According to one estimate, 10 percent of the nation's 1,000 enclosed malls will fail in the next several years, and many are currently struggling with vacancy rates of 35 to 50 percent. To give us more insight as to what is happening to these American shopping meccas is Bruce Leonard, 
managing principal of Street Sense, a real estate company focused on retail and mixed use properties. Bruce, good afternoon to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to you. Let me uh, start by basically asking what is going on with the shopping mall because it used to be the place to hang out, but I take it like everything else, it's suffering because of online shopping. Uh, yeah, there's essentially three major trends really that are affecting shopping malls and other retail uh, product types uh, in our nation. Uh, essentially, leading up to the subprime, there was a lot of growth in the retail industry in bricks and mortar. Uh, and basically, the subprime gave uh, the merchants really a chance to sort of set back and kind of look at where they were. And many feel now that they have far too many units in uh, particularly uh, second and third tier markets and are pulling back as leases are coming due. And you're seeing that reflected in vacancy in malls. The second trend was uh, there was a major demographic shift, which coincided right around the subprime as well, where the boomers who were the pre predominant you know, shopping generation for the last 20 years, there was a transition towards the upcoming generation's XY millennials. Uh, their shopping patterns of the millennial generation is far different than the boomers. And the retailers today are trying to adapt to the new shopping patterns. And then finally, as you mentioned, the internet is definitely, since 08, having a dramatic impact on retail. Not so much in competition, which is occurring, but it's also changing the way retail is done. Mm -hmm. And the retailers are trying to adjust to that. So store sizes are becoming smaller. smaller and that's the, obviously in real estate that becomes important as malls don't really need to be as big as they used to. Well, and I was going to ask you tenants. that. Do you, do you think that the days of the mega mall, like the Mall of America, over? I think actually what we're seeing two really predominant trends. We're seeing malls and A locations in major markets uh, still doing the same great numbers they've always done. They're really strong and viable. What we're seeing is malls in second, third, third tier uh, markets and also B and C locations in markets. They're the ones that are really starting to struggle because as the retailers are pulling back and contracting, they're targeting the weaker markets to, to pull their stores out of. So you're seeing uh, you know, this sort of trend exacerbating malls in those areas. The mega malls, uh, yeah, probably less relevant unless they can adapt to a more immersive or engaging experience for the consumer. So who hurt, gets hurt here? Not necessarily the retailers that are pulling out and doing something different, but basically the mall owners, right, developers. Right. Um, if I understood your question, yeah, the, the, there really hasn't been a significant mall built in this country since 06. I think the, the major mall developers saw the trends coming. They're quite sophisticated. Uh, you know, the retail pattern, you know, the mall, the, the real strength of the mall was the fact that it offered a convenient shopping venue for consumers and a lot of critical mass, and by that means a lot of stores. Well, the Internet does that better now. You have even broader selection of stores internationally, and you have, you know, a, a you know, a lot of convenience you can shop from your home. So where is retail going? People are using retail now for an engaging recreative experience. And what malls were, you know, sort of that prototype doesn't fit. So what you see are malls modifying themselves to offer the consumer a more engaging experience. Well, let me ask you something also. Uh, movie theaters uh, used to be a main anchor of malls. And there's competition mm -hmm. now for people's entertainment dollars as well. And, and in years past, movie theaters have been hurt and, and many of them closed. Is that one of the key elements here that these anchor stores and movie theaters are suffering as well? Certainly, there's, yeah, the movie theater industry has always been somewhat volatile, but I think basically uh, when a movie theater um, goes out of a mall, it's not as catastrophic to me as when the major department stores or anchors leave. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it can have an impact because the interesting thing about theaters is theaters drive food and entertainment. So that tends to be where the consumer is looking for their retail offerings right now. So certainly from that component, having a theater vacate a mall is significant and will impact its performance. Okay, Bruce Leonard, Managing Principal of Street Sense. Thank you. Thank you. Ahead, why the Canadians may be the only ones enjoying an ice cold beer in Sochi. You're watching a Rise Exchange. Well, Arise is the only network that really covers uh, comprehensively the African diaspora. It gives people in other parts of the world of color a chance to know about people here in the United States, us to know about them, and the world to know about us.
So it's kind of an educational experience for everybody involved. Getting to know people through stories, through personal stories. You really get a chance to know what people are actually all about, what communities are about. How are we different? But more importantly, what commonalities we all share. The great thing about Arise Entertainment 360 is that we cover the 360 of entertainment, food, fashion, lifestyle, culture. We're able to cover it all. And the thing I love most about the show is we're able to do a stunning combination of high and low. So we can talk about Rihanna on the red carpet, but we can also speak about high art with people like Sanford Biggers and Hank Willis. We actually spend quality time with our guests and we really get to know them. It's really intriguing because we get a 360 look at our guests. We have a true liquid lunch today. You would think that Russia might be the last place to ban alcohol. After all, it is the home of some of the best vodka in the world. But alas, the Russians are staging the driest Olympics in history by banning the sale of alcohol at Olympic events in Sochi. The reason? Memories of drunken fans during the Vancouver Games. But one country has thought of a workaround. Canada. The Canadian beer company Molson has set up beer refrigerators in the Olympic Village. The catch? Get this, you need a Canadian passport to get the beer out. <laughs> so you're kind of frustrated if you put in any other kind of passport, a dollar doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> that takes us to our favorite person of the day. When we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reasons. Today it is Wall Street Journal columnist James Toronto who likens women being sexually assaulted in college to drunk drivers. Toronto claims that there really isn't a problem with sexual assaults on college campuses, or for that matter in the military, because most of the incidents happen between two drunk people. He wrote, quote, in the Wall Street Journal, mind you, what is called on the problem of sexual assault on campus is in large part a problem of reckless alcohol consumption by men and women alike. And he goes on to make the following Eh, questionable analogy. If two drunk drivers are in a collision, he writes, one doesn't determine fault based on details such as the driver's sex, but when two drunk college students, quote, collide, the male is always presumed at fault. He ignores the overwhelming fact that men are often physically stronger than women and clear history that the bar scene in colleges hardly put men and women on equal footing. Of course, Toronto has previously asked whether, it, quote, it was worth it when three men died protecting their girlfriends during the Colorado movie shooting several years ago. Some issues there. So, Wall Street Journal op-ed writer James Taranto, Toronto is our favorite person of the day. Next, why human cells could be the key to curing many injuries. Our corner office is next. Arise serves underserved communities by bringing them news, information, sports, and entertainment from places that are becoming part of the world economy, that are becoming a part of the world voice, and decisions that are affecting things in the world that people care about. They care about the economy. They care about safety and security. And if you come to Arise and you watch our broadcast, these are the things we're going to bring to you every day, 24 hours a day. One of the great things about Arise Entertainment 360 is we have this Arise to Your Health segment, which really focuses on the holistic approach of being healthy. So we do everything from working out to juicing to getting in shape by doing fun exercises like bouncing on a trampoline or wearing these bouncy boots on our feet when we're jumping all over the set. We've done karate. We've danced the weight off. We've done just about everything. And of course, I love when we eat on set, but we do it in a very healthy and clean way. In tonight's corner office, for most athletes, injuries are a normal part of playing sports. But for an unfortunate few, many of these injuries are career-ending and life-threatening. Replicel is one company that's working on technology to treat ailments by treating your cells. It's called regenerative cell therapy, a new medical treatment being developed to treat ailments such as chronic tendonitis, suffered by many athletes, of course. David Hall is the CEO of Replicel, a Canadian company, and is here to talk about it. David, welcome to New York, and thank you so much for coming thank by. You, My All pleasure. Right. So, you know, for years we've been hearing about the promise of using one's own cells to help cure various ailments. How close are we getting to that being a reality? Well, in the case of, of the, the, the program that we're following, actually quite close. Um, in, and I expect that we can get an approval for treating chronic tendinosis within three years. How does that work? 
We take, it's very simple, we take um, a fibroblast cell that's isolated from a, a biopsy at the back of the scalp, we replicate it into the millions, um, and then we, under ult ultrasound imaging, direct those cells back into the area of, of the tendon damage. And that essentially jump starts the, the healing process that has been interrupted, and, then, and that's what the chronic program is. A chronic tendinosis is an in, incomplete cycle of healing, and that, mm -hmm. that's what we're addressing. We're jump starting and, and, and bringing back the healing process into a normalized pattern. So is it, is it, is it growing new cells? Is that what's happening? Well, yes, you start with um, a, a, a certain number of cells and you replicate them into almost 100 million cells. Okay, so let's follow this out a little bit for severe injuries. Is this a process that could help in people who, let's say, are paralyzed? Uh, that, that is something that you're now getting into the stem cell therapy, right. uh, which is where you have adult stem cell therapy into, in, where you induce cells to become a certain kind of cell. Our treatment is simply addressing a cellular deficit in a chronic injury, such as tendinosis, where we'll also go into ligaments and fascias and other um, repetitive stress injuries that, that, that many athletes have, you and I have, um, veterans coming back have chronic tendinosis. There's a huge market of people that are, are essentially um, um, crippled, if you will, mm -hmm. um, by the pain uh, involved. Um, how long does the th therapy take in the treatment, for example? The, it takes us about five to six weeks to replicate the cells. The cells are returned under ultrasound directly into the da area of damage, and it takes about six months to bring the patient back to full functionality and, and to... A permanent solution? And it, it is a permanent solution, um, and ca unless the patient goes in... And re-injures himself. Re yeah. um, what about the cost involved? Without <clears throat> specifically giving us numbers, uh, is this something that A, most insurance plans will cover, and B, is it something that's affordable? It most certainly will get covered by uh, groups like Workman's Compensation because the alternative of long-term uh, disability and even this, the period of time where they're paying short-term um, um, uh, fees to for physiotherapy, et cetera, um, is quite significant. So getting someone back to work and functioning, let alone the quality of life quotient, is quite within the realms of what we're doing. Tell me about the FDA approval process, because that is an incredibly lengthy one. And where are you in that process, and how do you feel it is going? We are going into a phase two trial um, of 82 patients, which will actually be done in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, at the, uh, <clears throat> the university. Um, under the international rules of harmonization, that, pr that trial data can be used in the U.S. So um, at the end of 2015, we'll then start to look to the U.S. to do a pivotal trial, which will then take another year. So ergo, a couple of years to get this done. So many companies, and I don't know if I'd put you in a biotech. Is, are you in the biotech yeah, space? Okay. It. So so many biotech companies, uh, there was a sort of biotech boom for a while, and they, and they did not reach their promised land, if you will. Uh, what, what makes you think you're going to get there, and what are the key ingredients to doing so? Well, I, I actually think that biotech has gone through, I mean, the first um, uh, wave was sort of beginning in the 70s and into the 90s with recombinant um, proteins. There's many profitable um, mm -hmm. companies then. And then, then you went into the genomics um, level, and now we're going into the uh, regenerative medicine wave. And it does take a long time. Uh, the difference between what we're doing in terms of um, stem cell therapy is we're not actually inducing cells to change. We're actually just taking um, a, a source cell and making more of them and putting them in to where there's a deficit of that particular so cell So it's type. a slightly easier process yes. or, or most of the Very work has already so. been done by nature yeah. itself. Uh, where else can this uh, technology go in treating ailments? Well, we're treating, we have a phase one trial that we're planning for the, later this year for treating um, wrinkles or sun damaged skin. Uh, we have a phase two trial, uh, um, which we'll also begin in 2014 uh, for treating pattern baldness. Okay, well, that, that's certainly good news. <laughs> um, in the case of the fibroblast platform, there are other indications that we will be bringing along that, that are related to deficits of fibroblasts. Okay, finally, we have 30 seconds. How did you get involved? We always like to ask people taking on I challenges. I started in the biotech business in uh, the late 1990s um, with a company called Angiotech, where we actually put um, microscope amounts of uh, chemotherapeutic on a stent, which we licensed to a company called Boston Scientific. And once in the business and just this. became hooked and, um, you know, I, I think that, that there, it's a noble cause to be trying to, to sure. find solutions for patients that are crippled and in pain. 
Um, so I quite enjoy that okay. aspect of it. David Hall, continue to luck. Thank you very much, the CEO of Rep. LaSalle. Thank Appreciate you very it. much, Ian. Later this week, sophisticated attacks on the power grids in Silicon Valley, leaving companies powerless and investigators baffled. Could this be part of a larger plan? We'll explore the problem Friday here on Arise Exchange. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Good evening, everyone.